Um, I hope you guys are all having a good week, a good new year. That's right. I, I feel like all through January, you're allowed to, you know, feel like it's still the new year and you're still getting your feet underneath you. Um, it is always funny though, when it's like March and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, it's not a new year anymore. Like I need to get on those goals. I need to like, you know, get myself together and going, but, um, Anyways, hope you guys are all having a lovely day, lovely year so far. Um, today, I have an amazing guest. I have Alex Garth, or Gas Garth, sorry, from All Time Low. And he's been a good friend of mine for years. So I'm really excited to get to talk to him more. And um, also, a fun little fact right now, I'm actually on a social media break right now, which is really good. I, I think it's important because we all consume so much content every single day. And especially, you know, during the Christmas season, I'm always on social media a ton, you know, and especially this year I had a new album. So I was always on social media, um, trying to post things, trying to get ideas. And then I got in this really bad habit of just constantly scrolling. And then the new year hit and I'm not posting really much right now, but yet still I was scrolling and scrolling so much. And so anyways, it's been kind of nice to just detox a little bit. Also, when you um, log out of all of your apps, you realize how often your thumb just mindlessly hits that Instagram or TikTok button, you know, just when you're standing there and you don't even realize it and your thumb hits the button and it comes up as a login screen and you're like, oh my gosh, that's right. Um, it suddenly makes it a conscious choice. Um, so anyways, I have been enjoying my little social media break. Um and uh, yeah, I think it, it's healthy to do. My managers are pulling up the slack for me though. So they've been posting on my Instagram about stuff like this to keep everybody informed. <clears throat> so shout out to my managers. But um, Alex is here. So I'm going to invite him into the chat right now. So here we go. Inviting him in. And Alex is a part of the band. He's the lead singer actually of the band All Time Low. I'm sure you guys all know that. Um, but yeah, Alex is a good friend of mine, known each other for years. So I'm so excited to have him here, but, um, Alex, how are you doing today? You'll probably have to unmute yourself, by the way. Thank you for that tip. The hot <laughs> tip of how to use this app. Appreciate it. Hi, how are you? I'm so good. How are you doing? I'm great. I was just listening to you talk about your, uh, little social media break and I, I, uh, I feel you. Oh, do you ever do those where you just go offline for like two weeks? To be completely honest with you, I have never done it to the extent that I probably should have in the past. Like I've always mm. said, I'm going to take a break. And then about four, three, maybe two days later, I'm like, hey guys, it's me. I'm back. Remember remember me? Okay, and yeah, I was yeah. like, you, you lasted 48 hours, bud. What are you doing? <laughs> um, yeah. So I kind of, I like this last year and this year i made it a point to be much more uh conscious of how much time mm -hmm. and attention i was giving to you know the instagrams et cetera, et cetera. and um yeah it's it's just hearing you say that that little that twitch that your thumb gets of kind of mm -hmm. um wanting to open the app it's it's pretty wild and it's it's very yeah. real. how did you go about trying to like i don't know pull it back um, that's a very good question. I think for me personally, it was just uh, a shift in mindset of just going like, mm. this really is, this really is kind of running things for me right now. Like the need to yeah. open is defining a big part of my behavior and that needed a hard look. Um, yeah. so it was, it was kind of just be, becoming self-aware of it, I guess, you know, which is always easier to talk about when you're on the other side of that thing that you're trying to get over. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. My sister is like, got great self-control and she, I've never done this myself, but she always logs out of the apps so that it's a real conscious choice because then she has to put her passcode in. And mm -hmm. so it makes her think like, do I really want to go onto Instagram because I have to like type my password in or am I just mindlessly like filling space? And I was like, that's a really great idea. Like I said, I've never done it myself, but you know, it's actually it was a, an, it's an amazing device. Yeah. That's like a really good way to, to sort of check yourself for sure. Absolutely. Um, well, okay. I I'm so excited to have you here. I mean, I, I'm trying to even remember when we met, but we met, gosh, like 
eight years ago, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I want to say it was, uh, oh man, 2014, 15? I know, I remember when. I remember it was at a festival and Alex and I share a mutual friend, um, our dear friend Gavi, who you guys yeah. know I've talked about a bunch. He, he passed away, but he um, introduced me to All Time Low when we were both playing at the same festival somewhere in Europe. And um Anyways, I, I just remember feeling so cool because you guys were playing on like a bigger stage than us. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're meeting this cool band. And oh, Gavi was on. so like introduced me to you guys. <laughs> no way. I remember Gavi being out there uh, and, and introducing us. And I was already like very aware of everything you were doing. And um, just remember like watching your, catching some of your show and, and being like, wow, this is this is something else. It's unreal. And I, ever since then, I've been in awe of like the way that you operate. Oh, well, thank you. I, um, I, and you guys, um, I'm fascinated by your story and your band because you guys met in high school and the same exact members are still together today. And as you know, that is such a rarity that bands can stay together and that, you know, usually at least one or two players are kind of switched out. Like, so what is the secret? What is it that's kept your band together and close? And you guys are also still friends. You know, it's not like you guys just grin and bear it. Like you guys are all, <laughs> um, you know, you're close still and you guys enjoy each other. So what is the key to keeping your band that way? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I think, I mean, first and foremost, I, I, I have to be real and just say that like, I, at this point, 20 years into our career this year, I think marks 20 years precisely. Wow. So we started freshman year of high school. Um, it was 2003. Yeah. So, um, and we, you know, at first it was nothing, it was nothing serious. It was nothing, um, that we were, we had any plans for it was just, you know, we would all get together and uh, turn our amps up really loud and Ryan would hit the drums really hard and we would, <laughs> make, you know, annoy my parents basically. Um, and it was, but it was fun. It was, we knew we were having fun and it, we sounded like a really bad version of all the bands that we loved at the time. And that was, that was enough, you know, and yeah. um, we were fortunate to turn that into something that, that, uh, got a little bit of traction in our hometown. And then from there, it got a little bit of attention up the East coast. And from there, it got a little bit, bit of attention from producers and record labels. And, um, by our senior year, we were hit up by a record label and they wanted to sign us and put us out on the warp tour. And, um, I attribute that slow growth a lot to mm -hmm. kind of what has, has played into us being such good friends and maintaining the relationship for as long as we have, because I think it grew really naturally from this place of like, we never expected this to go anywhere. So every time we found a win or anytime we've had something work, a success, anything, it's been extremely humbling. And it always reminds us of where we started. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, when that's sort of at your core, when you're four people coming together to do something uh, with this, I guess, unified goal in mind, it goes a long way. You know, it, it, it kind of, it, it's a constant reminder of, of what we're trying to achieve and why we're all in this. And from there, it's just, you know, checking in and being uh, a human being about things and, and, and managing it like any other relationship and, and sort of, you know, there are times when relationships get strained. There are times when the friendships get strained. There are times when, um, you know, you don't agree with a choice that someone or another person makes, but you talk it out, you figure it out and you come to an understanding and you, everybody learns from that. Everybody grows from that and you keep going. And, um, yeah, I think, I think we've been really lucky in that we've, we've gotten to sort of hear each other out and, and grow in that way. Yeah. That's, that's such a good point about like slow growth. Like I'm really glad that I, in a similar way, just kind of, I, I there was no moment that exploded my career. It was just like one tour after another, one song after another, and they all kind of kept building on each other. And I think that helps with overall sanity, you know, in this yeah. business, those huge jumps up and down, you know, really can affect someone's ego for better and for worse. And, um, you know, and I think that is like what you said, it's what causes these, these shifts and how people feel about groups or about themselves or about each other. And, um, and there is something about like, everybody wants that big break, that huge moment, but it's, 
you know, sometimes it's for the best to just accept that the best things come like literally just line upon line and one step at a time. 100%. I think I don't know exactly when in the 20 year career (laughs) that I just referenced, I learned this, but you know, at some point along the way, it really dawned on me to that managing expectations is one of the biggest facets Mm. of this whole thing. Uh, When you have this big dream and you're so driven to, to conquer it and get to, you know, the next, whatever that pinnacle may be. um, I, I think when you really start to break through is when you learn to manage your expectations and go, okay, didn't quite get there this time, but what's the next foot up? What's the next step to, to mm-hmm. keep striving towards that thing? Um, and I, I think that went a long way in our philosophy uh, for, mm-hmm. you know, why we've been really lucky to, to sort of stand the test of time. And, and I'm sure you have sort of been through those moments as well. No, that's such a good point. Like managing your expectations and also like you, you kind of learn to ride the highs and lows a lot Mm -hmm. more evenly, like the highs. And I remember someone told me that when I first started, like you got to learn how to make the highs not quite as high and the lows not quite as low. And I was like, well, who wants to live like that? Like I want to have the big highs. And, you know, it was like my pure artist soul. But it's very true that you have to learn how to like, you know, be on stage in front of all these fans and, and realize that that's amazing. But then realize that that can, you know, not take you quite as high so that the lows don't sink as low. Like you have to just manage all of those, those ups and downs. And I don't know, it's been an interesting thing to learn to ride all those waves and to manage all the expectations as you go. It's really funny to hear you say that because I feel like it is that sort of, uh, you sort of said like the artist brain and it's like there, there is that thing of you, we, I think we all, the any creative sort of seeks those big, uh, really defining um, ebbs and flows, the peaks and valleys. And, and, um, Mm -hmm. I, I know for me definitely, uh, in my, like, that's always inspired my creative, my process, my writing. It's like the, the lowest lows and the highest highs are always the things that I'm like, Oh, time to write a song, time to write a record. Like, let me pull from those moments. And then Mm -hmm. learning it's almost, it's almost like as an artist, you're, you're sort of juggling this, this desire to have those high highs and low lows while also not coming off the rails and not being defined by those things and, and trying to cruise somewhere in the middle. And it's like, yeah. really, it's this really interesting dichotomy, I think, you know, staying creative and, and trying to mm-hmm. lean into those things that make you maybe um, feel more inspired versus, you know, not completely undoing yourself by, by riding those highs and lows too much, you know? Right. Oh my gosh. I feel like there's a great, like, concept for a music video that like an analogy or some kind of visual that could be made about what you just described because it feels like such a visual concept to me as you talk about it (laughs) like you know towing this like tightrope while there's the highs and lows on either side that you're trying to grab at you know but still stay on your tightrope like (laughs) yeah it's it's a tricky one to navigate I feel by Mm -hmm. the way speaking of music videos like can we talk about how good your videos are Lindsay (laughs) Like, oh, well, thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. <laughs> I, I like genuinely, I, I don't think there's anyone that does it better. And it's, uh, I, I, um, yeah, I, I'm floored by how sick and amazing your videos are. So, oh my gosh. Well, thank yeah. you so much. I, you know, my little filmmaker heart, I went to film school like in college. I was going to be a director once upon a time. And oh, so, right this is, like, my way of still expressing that side of myself is like, I love to make my little films and like visually bring the music to life. I've always felt like the music is like only half of the story and I get really excited to always make the music video. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, by the way. The visual is so important. Yeah, I was going to ask you because so I just watched um, Tell Me I'm Alive, the video, and I thought it was a really fun video and I loved that there was (laughs) even like choreography in it and I was like, oh, did you guys like actually learn like work with a choreographer or did you guys you know make that yourselves or it was it was just really engaging and really fun so maybe tell me a little bit about the song and the and the music video for sure um and this was in no way an effort to derail the conversation towards something that i did but but thank you for being such a good host and steering it that direction um <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah no i uh i we did we we put out a new song and um it was the first time that i had uh kind of put my hand up and said, Hey, can I try directing something? And it was, I honestly, I think it was for the same reasons you 
are so hands on with your approach. Um, it was just sort mm-hmm. of like every time I, I write a song, I, I see some kind of narrative to go along with it. And um, yeah. a lot of the time, I, I you know, in, in the past, I've been really driven or uh, kind of outspoken about. I think this is where the video could go, or it could have some kind of theme like this. But I usually uh, have handed that off to people that know better than me. And um, I, this was the first time where I said, like, can I, like, I had written out a full treatment and I went, can I have a crack at doing this? And fortunately, uh, a friend of mine, DJ Bronner, who was the co-director with me on the video, um, was, was down to have me sort of um, learn the ropes through him. And, and that was really, really cool and really inspiring. And um, yeah, like I, I kind of, I looked at it as this opportunity to have us as a band do things that people haven't really seen us do before. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make something that was a, a little bit shocking and a little bit um, just strange and out there. Cause that's usually where I come from with things. Uh, And Mm -hmm. B, you know, like with the the choreography and dance and, and these beats that I don't think all time low videos have hit that often throughout our, you know, music videos. um, It was, it was just like, what, what can we do that we haven't done? And so the obvious choice was like, we've been in it for 20 years. (laughs) exactly it's like let's have let's have all four of us learn how to do a dance in the back of like this tiny tight space which in the context of the video is is the back of an ambulance and um Mm -hmm. and and yeah it just it it was an exercise in like I think just pushing ourselves to do some things that we'd never done before and and that um was was just a really fun experience first of all but but I think it's been met with such a cool reaction because you know i think our our the people have been following us for a long time are kind of just like we maybe didn't expect it maybe didn't you know um you know know that that was something that we were even capable of albeit that it's like sloppy as hell and ridiculous but um you know it's it's, it's a fun thing to, to dip your toes into yeah, absolutely. And I, I did enjoy that there was a lot of layers to the music video. There was a story, <laughs> there, was, there was acting in it, there was choreography, there was like location switches. And, you know, as a video nerd myself, I like really pay attention to all those elements and the color palette was really cool. So um, I'm, I'm curious, what did you, like, I don't know, did you learn anything stepping into the director's chair? Did it make you realize anything new or I, I don't know, what was your experience like directing? I learned an incredible amount. Um a lot of which I'll probably forget for the next one, but you know, it's, it's, I think, you know, so much of it was like, it's like the technicalities and you, I, I went in knowing what I like and what I don't like and knowing how to point at something and go like, Hey, I think that could look really cool. But then you, mm-hmm. you turn to all the people on set that really know what they're doing and you go like, how do I, how do I say this in, <laughs> in like, yeah. in video speak? And, um, yeah. and, and then it was, it was really cool being sort of, walk through the technical side of everything having you know you said you went to school for it I did not and so I came into it very um you know sort of ignorant uh to the process and um just being sort of guided through by people that really knew what they were doing and and you know even just down to like hey we can't shoot this at at uh you know 48 because the neon fights the frame rate like things like that and you just don't even think about it. You, what do you mean we can't do this shot in slow motion? And then they're like, mm-hmm. well, the neon blinks. And it's you would never, ever, ever think of that as someone who doesn't understand anything about cameras. And um, and then you have to mm-hmm. on the fly go, okay, well, what do we do then? Um, right. And you you sort of adjust and, and uh, you, you make so many of those decisions on the fly. And for me personally, in the past, having been somebody on set of the music video, watching those things happen in real time, but not really understanding what was going on, it gives you such an appreciation for like the amount right. of work and effort and and thought that goes into these things in the moment of just, mm-hmm. okay, we got to make like a really quick left turn here, you know? And um, mm-hmm. so those are some of my biggest takeaways of, of just, it made me appreciate the process even more. Like I, I have always loved making music videos, but this time around, I really got to see it from the other side and and it gives you so much respect for how the whole thing goes down. 
Absolutely. No, it is so true. How many times on a set, you know, you do all the preparation, you think you've thought of everything and you really feel like you're prepared. And then suddenly like things just happen. It's like kind of like in a live live show, you, you can't predict everything. And yeah, sometimes you just have to really think on your feet and be quick and adaptable. And, um, but yeah, it's so, so smart that you had someone there to kind of like that co-directing you know, see, so you could actually learn and not just get thrown in the deep end by yourself. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Like you, you said, it's kind of like a live show, and it, it, that that is a that's really interesting in that it, it. You know, I don't I don't think when you go into uh, you know shooting something that's coming out after the fact and it goes through all these editing processes and all these you know post production and visual effects and you, you kind of don't think of it as being anything close to mm -hmm. live you know right. but then there really are these moments where it's like i you have one you have this idea in mind that you're fully set on nailing it and then you just have to pivot and and get it right a different way and that is so accurate with how it works on stage you know like you know some, you, you trip over you stumble over something and then it's like how do you sell that how do you make it look right. how do you make it look like oh i meant to do that you know it's an Absolutely. interesting thing <laughs> Um, well, here, I would love to listen to Tell Me I'm Alive. So this is your newest release, right? Yeah, we just put this out uh, last week, two, a week and a half ago. Um, and it's it's track one of the new album. We have an album coming out uh, by the same name. And this is sort of like the the title track and the one that sets the whole body of work up. Amazing. All right, everybody. So this is possibly the AMP um, debut of Tell Me I'm Alive. So here we go. Let's go. Woohoo! I hey, love hey. that. That is super fun. And everybody in the chat was saying how much they were enjoying it too. There's a little chat feature. So yeah, um, I just found the chat during that song and it was very fun to actually say hi. Yeah, right. Um, well, that, that's such a good song. That melody that the da 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 da. Oh, it's so good. It's such like an earworm melody that just stays in the brain and it's good. Thank you. It's okay. um, Thank you. Appreciate that. So you've been um I mean, it's it's just wild to me that you guys have done nine studio albums. Is this your 10th one that's coming out? So this is a heavily debated topic within our fan base. Okay. Um, <laughs> the so there is, yeah, there is. Yeah, about to spill the tea. So I considered this to be LP8. Okay. And we, so there's like, there's a full length that was not, it was like self-released and we don't consider it canon if that makes sense okay. don't um, <laughs> and then there's like there's an ep it's like seven songs that some people consider an album but it's not really an album so i th i think it's lp8 technically okay but but yeah that, so lp8 with a couple other like almost but this is the official eighth in your guys's mind and i say hey the fans can debate but at the end of the day like you know, you're the artist, you're the band, you guys get to decide like what, <laughs> what it is. So, okay. This is you your know what eight. I kind of love about it though. It's like, again, this is, this is that the thing that happens when you've done it for enough time and there's fans that have been around for decades. There's fans that have been around for five years. There's fans that have just figured out about us, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And like, it becomes this like debate within the fandom and, I, I kind of, I kind of love that we have like fictions within fictions within fictions. It's almost yeah. like, I don't know, like I nerd out about like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Marvel <laughs> movies. And like, it's the same way that I argue with people about like whether, you know, Han Solo made the Kessel Run and whatever the parsecs means, you know, that whole thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And okay. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, this is our little internal, um, our little internal battle about what the, what the official all time low canon is. And I love that. I, that is really fun. And especially like that just shows that you have a healthy fan like community when there yeah. is enough culture within the fan group to be able to have stuff to talk about and debate about. And like, you know, um, you know, and there is a certain ownership there. So, so no, you're right. That is really fun. That, it's um, nice. It means it means people care, and I love exactly. that. Exactly. You know, so you mentioned that, like, I feel like you must have such an interesting fan, like, base because you have such loyal fans. Like, people that are all-time low fans are, like, loyal, loyal fans. Like, someone who I used to work with, she helped um, do marketing at um, my management company, and she was, you know, 
like in her thirties, like mid thirties. And she's like a huge all time low fan will always be like, wow. so do you guys, you seem to have a, a combination of like the younger generation and then the diehards. Like, do you find that like there is a divide in your fan group because of that, or do they all just kind of come into the same pot? I think at the end of the day, it coalesces, you know, I, I think, um, we've always tried to nurture a really, uh, positive vibe around our fan base. I mean, really from day one, we've always said that the, the biggest and most important aspect of our, um, of all time low is, is the shows and the, uh, you know, coming together and celebrating together and having a great time and leaving whatever troubles you at the door and, and Mm -hmm. enjoying, and then, you know, getting back to it. And, um, I think there's something very unifying and bonding about that. It's it's what I appreciated about shows when I was a kid and was going to shows, you know, religiously um, from, you know, I guess 13 to my adulthood. Um, and it's what I've always enjoyed about it is that when you're standing in a crowd and you're watching this band play and you're feeling the music, you're feeling the energy, you, not only are you connected with the the band, but you're kind of connected with everybody in the room because you're all sort of sharing this moment together. And the, this idea that, um, you know, you all exist in unison and at, at once and you're all happy to be with each other and there. And um, that's sort of been the driving force, I think of, of, and what we've focused on and, and all time low. And so I think when there's, you know, whether it's, like you said, whether it's longtime fans, new fans, um, what, whoever you may be, uh, it, it's everybody's coming together for the same reason. And mm-hmm. we're playing for that reason. And we're yeah. up on stage for that reason. And that is such a unifying thing in that moment that that's, that, that's the thing I appreciate the most and, and really what I take away from doing this the most. Absolutely. There's something that's so, so special. And I feel so spoiled that, um, you know, in the kind of art that we make, we get the opportunity on a regular basis to enjoy it with the people we make it for, you know, where like for actors, it's not that same thing. Like they'll work for months on a film or writers, they'll work for months on something, but very few arts do people get to stand there and like share and enjoy it with the people you made it for. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it really is such a unifying thing that, yeah, it kind of, does make you realize it doesn't matter what age group you are or where you're from. Like we are all here for the same reason. And that's to connect through, you know, something we all love. So 100%. that's really special. Um, do you guys, I mean, you guys tour a lot. Like, do you like what still keeps you excited about touring? I think it's just that. I think it's the, the, the energy that we feel um, from the stage and the the notion that people care and want to see and share in what we do and what we put our effort into, um, mm-hmm. you know, as you know, it's it's no it's no small feat to to pour yourself into creating something. You know, sometimes a, a song or an idea flows very freely and it's very easy, and you just sort of like, for lack of a better term, you barf it out, and then it's it exists, and you're like, well, that was mm-hmm. awesome. Other yeah. times, it's like a struggle to kind of. Um, put these ideas together and have it form meaning and, and connect in a way that you really hope that it does. And when people jive with that and then uh, spend their hard earned money to come and share it with you in a room, I mean, that's mm-hmm. all the reason we need, you know, if the, the shows people show up and so we show up, you know, that's, that's really what it comes down to in my mind. Yeah. It, you know, and whenever I go to a show, you're, yeah, you're reminded like, wow, this is a process. Like, and you know, I have to find parking and like, I spent basically <laughs> the entire day like around this event and I've been looking forward to it for weeks. And like, you know, I picked my outfit and then, you know, it, it really makes you reminded of like what a uh, experience it is for anyone coming. Like one, the, the time and the money and the sacrifice, but also like the excitement, like that's why I, anytime I'm about to go on a tour again, I always try to be a consumer and like put myself back in the situation of what does it feel like to be a fan? Like all the different sides of it, the excitement and the, you know, the stress of like hoping you're on time. And, um, and it just really does make you appreciate the entire experience that, you know, we get to do and get to share even a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, do you guys still throw the guitars? I have to know. (laughs) Um, yeah, we do. I, honestly, uh, against 
better judgment? Yeah, we do. We um, you do every show. Yeah, as long as there's someone there to catch them. Um, we yeah. are very fortunate. We we uh, <laughs> I, we give everybody in guitar world a crash course and make sure that they're willing uh, to yeah. go through that. Um, we Here, had, you should explain it though, in case because your fans, I'm sure that they expect it and they know it's going to happen every show. But just for someone who hasn't been to an all time low show, explain the the throwing guitars. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the, the very end of our show, there is a song called Dear Maria Count Me In. And um, at the end of that song, uh, myself and Jack, our, our guitar player, um, kind of just lob our guitars to, I throw mine now to our aux musician. His name is Dan Swank. He plays piano and, and some auxiliary guitars and sings and does all kinds of stuff with us live on stage. So he takes, takes over for me at the end of that song. Um, Jack usually lobs his to um, the guitar tech on the other side of the stage who usually knows how to play the song um, and and does that. And we both go into the crowd um, and just make this like nice special moment with everybody. And um, it has been a thing that we've done for, I don't know, since like t- probably 2006, 2007 on Warped Tour. I think we yeah. saw, who was it? There was a band. Oh, so there's a there's a band called Story of the Year. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they those guys are bonkers with their on stage stunts. I would call it like they they were doing like cartwheels and like all these guitar spins and whatever. And when I was a kid, I was in the crowd and watched them and went, "Oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen." Um, mm. So, and I think the only thing I was capable of doing was just throwing my guitar as hard as I could. I couldn't figure out the other stuff. So yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do a backflip. Um, so that part stuck. And uh, yeah, it's, it's like, we've had a few, we've had a few moments where it's gone awry. Um, but for the most part, I would say like our batting average is, is really good. Like it's, we're, 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 yeah. we've nailed it most of the time, but we have a, you and I have a mutual friend who uh guitar tech for us for a long time who um did hmm. did take a guitar to uh the forehead one one show oh well, no yeah danny danny, <laughs> it, was uh, danny? <laughs> it was it was danny shoot oh no <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> i'll never forgive myself oh and, and you threw it <laughs> Yeah, I lobbed it, and I, I don't know if I, like, put a little too much spin on it or just <laughs> under through it or what, but it clocked oh, it in the shoot. head. And yeah, we were, you know, I was, on, I was on the bus with him that night, like, holding the ice pack. <laughs> oh, shoot, that's everything from, like, painful to embarrassing. You know, you're like, yeah, I got hit in the face with the guitar tonight. It's fine. To, to, <laughs> to his hurt. credit, though, I, like, not to interrupt you, but to his credit, actually, this just, I, rem- I remembered, he, uh, he finished the song. So he, oh, yeah. yeah, he like, he took the hit and I think, you know, maybe blacked out for a second and then put the guitar on and finished the song and then walked off stage and went, ow. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Hey, that's a true yeah. performer right there. You yeah. know, that's so funny. Um, have you ever, have you ever gotten injured on stage? Sorry to ask. It's a morbid question, but like, mm-hmm. is that, have you ever got, had like a weird one or like a twisted ankle, anything? You know, I've, um. I've fallen once. Like, I, I really think it's only one time that I've ever fallen with all the things that I do. Like, I trip walking up the stairs or like, you know, I trip walking down the street. <laughs> but for some reason, when I'm playing a violin and I am doing the choreography, I am usually pretty locked in. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there was one time I fell. And I remember as I hit the ground, I was like, did I just break my tailbone? Because I fell right. But I stood up oh. and everything was fine. And, you know, I just laughed. I was like, I can't believe that just happened. Um, but, you know, you got to love stage performing because there are just things that happen. For me, the more typical things that happen are like a costume breaks, like on stage. Yeah. Like, and like a, a zipper pops off. And all of a sudden I can feel that I think my zipper is sliding. Yeah, I think my zipper is all the way down. Like that oh. kind of stuff is the more. <laughs> and I have to just like waddle off stage backwards, like while smiling. Um, but I don't know, like what what are some things that have happened to you guys on stage? Like, Can you think of any other besides hitting Danny in the face with a guitar? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just always one of those things, you know, it's like and I think uh, to your point, it's like you you in the moment you're so determined and to Danny's credit as well, like you're so determined not to let it derail the show 
Yeah. You just, you just don't want to outwardly admit that like, Oh, something just went wrong. You know, you want to, you want to play it off like everything's fine. And um, yeah, I mean, I've had, I've had a wardrobe malfunction, I think one time and it mm. like the, the, <laughs> the, the crotch of my pants ripped and it was oh, just, no. yeah, <laughs> I just, I sort of just played the rest of the show that way and it was fine it, but it, you yeah. know everybody was laughing every time I walked around everybody was pointing at me and I was just like yeah I know this is like you know those like anxiety dreams you have where you're like you're right. naked in school or something like it was Absolutely. that moment I was like oh this is the real this is the real thing happening right <laughs> here it is I've been yeah. Yeah, dreaming and prepping for this my entire life and now here we go. <laughs> <laughs> totally um and then I had I slipped I I misjudged the edge of a stage one time and at the end it was the same song the end of his song, like, uh, sort of just accidentally walked myself into the pit. Um, oh. Yeah. And that was, that was a fun one. Um, yeah. I think I, 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 think I clocked my, like- no, I clocked my head on the barricade, but then, you know, sort of finished oh. the song and then got back on stage and went like, oh, I'm like, I see the birds spinning around my head kind of thing. Um, yeah. Oh we've my had God. a few, we've had a few, nothing too crazy. Um, I think. I think there was a time where, you know, I'm sure you, I'm sure you've done pyro on stage, right? Actually, no, I've never done pyro. Really? Yeah. I, I've wanted to, and then usually it's the, you know, it's like almost makes it and it's the like last thing that gets cut. Cause we're like, you know what, we'll, we'll rather have this, but I've almost done it a couple of times, but I'm not quite as like hardcore as you guys. So I usually have more like glitter falling from the ceiling. <laughs> That's totally fair. And I, to be honest, I'm with you. Like the, the pyro, while it's amazing, it's like a terrifying and B super expensive. So <laughs> I kind of, yeah. kind of don't blame you. Um, well, here, I'll tell you my glitter guy. If you want to try the like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, can you refer me to a good, a glitter, a glitter person? Um, <laughs> <Right in your show. laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but like, so we had one where we were doing these things, they're called uh cold sparks for the, the folks listening. And um, they sort of, I think we had them sort of falling down from the top of the stage and they, uh, they are called cold sparks because even if they hit you, they don't burn you. Hmm. However, what they don't tell you is they do burn. They're just not super hot if they land on your skin. But if they go in your eye, they're, oh. it's not great. And so Ryan, we had like two, I think, cold spark pillars on either side. And, and Ryan was next to one of them. Ryan's our drummer. And uh, just mid song, I think like one caught him in the eye. And he, oh. he was, yeah. Had, and again, it's that thing of like, he was freaking out as you would, you know? Right. Did I just blow my retina? Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And he, he got through the rest of the song and then I turned around and like, he was missing from stage. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> and uh, well. yeah, what a, what a champion though. What a trooper. Like it, it's that thing again, you just, <laughs> you always find a way to get through the song and then you worry about the grievous bodily harm that you've just faced. It's, it's so true. And you know, there's something also about like, when you're on stage, you you have all this adrenaline that kind of gives you that, like, no, I can make it through this. Like, I can do it. You know, I might have fallen down or I might have, like, you know, hurt myself. Like, I know my dancers will do that. Like, you know, one of my dancers slammed her hand in a door backstage as she was running out for a song and, like, thought her hand, like, thought she'd broken her fingers. Oh, but she man. finished the song and, like, finished the show before she, you know found out if her hand was okay but it's like part of it is also like a team effort like i can't let down the team they're counting on me (laughs) Yep, exactly exactly well there's someone in your i'm reading your comments right now i don't mean to derail but someone said there's a suggestion for your show i think it's your imagine elements live and there's a wind portion and a fire portion and a water portion that'd be insane well, that would be very cool. I'm saving that idea. I'm going to put that in my back pocket for when I have my yeah. Vegas residency. <laughs> um. And uh, yeah, because that would be that would be freaking amazing to get like all the different things on stage. I love it. I Is get all anything- my best production ideas from <laughs> the chat. Yeah. Exactly. Was there anything you've ever wanted to do on stage that like is in your back pocket of like, like I've never done pyro, but I'm always like, it'd be really cool. Um. Okay, so... You know, like, I think the last person I saw do this uh, was maybe Billie Eilish, but I'm sure a million other people have done it recently. But like, you know, the thing where you sort of like you get launched out from under the stage. Oh, yeah. I, I want to do that so badly. Oh, that would be so good because your show so energetic. Like that would fit really well. Yeah, that's like, give me that. If any, if anyone in the production world is listening, 
help, help all time low get the okay get the launch. I think they, <laughs> do they still call them like pop like popcorners or something? I think that's yeah. what Mike Jackson would refer to them as. They are they're so epic and and yeah, I, I'm I'm very jealous of everyone who's uh gotten to do that. And we have a we have a show coming up at Wembley Arena in London <gasps> uh in March, and that place would allow for that. So now I'm like after um, this, I'm gonna I'm gonna start blowing up my managers and just being like, Hey, <laughs> Lindsay made me, <laughs> Lindsay forced me to do this. <laughs> hey, if there's a place to do it, I mean, Wembley, that's like, I mean, I know you've played there before, I believe, but that's like a bucket list place. It's so special. You should, you should add it. Yep. It's happening now. You owe it to yourself. Get to the team. <laughs> would you get it or would you get one for all the band? Would everybody get one? No, I think we all have to get launched, right? It can't just be me. That's true. And then you guys, and I'm sure you have to do some like cool training. I always get excited when I get to like learn something new that I have to train for. I feel like really, you know, badass. I'm like, oh, I get to like <laughs> train. So yep. Yep. yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Don't tell, don't tell your man, your manager knows me. So don't tell him that I made you do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be calling you after this. Like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> be like Lindsay. That's the last time that I let Alex do an interview with you. We already ran um, the budget for this tour, and now we're in the red. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. man, don't you just wish we could just do all of our ideas and that budget wasn't a thing? You know what? Yes, <laughs> yes, I do. It's so exciting to think big. Like whenever I plan a new tour, I just let myself think without limits at first and mm -hmm. then we rein it in but it's, it's it helps me be more creative but man it's so the the ideas it's so fun and you're like what i could do if only but um i yeah. think that's, like, that's the that's the thing though that's what we were talking about before that's like the the high highs and the low lows and then you find the thing where it like actually makes sense in the middle and it mm. kind of it speaks to the same thing like i think you have to go into it with like what's the most wild thing I can think of that we could do. And then how do I scale it back from there to a right. point where it makes sense? And then you still end up with something amazing. Right. Well, and it's, it's interesting how sometimes I'll bring these ideas to my crew and they'll be like, you know, like you said, we can't do that, but like, oh, we could do this, which is very close. And this is something we can make and we can, you know, and so you realize that sometimes you're not as far away from your dream goal or your dream idea as, you think you are. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah. um, I think we should play um, Dear Marie, Count Me In, because you were saying that was the one that you guys would like throw the guitars on, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, and was this, like, I don't know, was this one of the first songs that like really put you guys on the big map? Yeah. So uh, what's kind of funny about this song is like, it, this was the single, one of the singles from our first official canon full length. And, um, we, uh, it, it, it stuck and it became like a really, I guess, uh, defining song for us in our catalog. And, um, it was one of those ones that even in the early days, it put its hand up and it stood the test of time. And then as time has gone on, it's just continued to sort of be a big part of our world. And, mm. you know, like a couple of years ago, it had this whole other moment um, wh where it like took hold on TikTok for a second. And like, we weren't really even paying attention over there, if I'm being honest. And, and it, it had this whole resurgence. And I think at first it was kind of ironic to be fair um, with how it took hold, but then it just, it kind of blew the song up again. And like, I just got an email uh, like two days ago that the song went triple platinum oh. <laughs> like, out all these years later. Wow. And so it's yeah, it's crazy. Like it just it's one of those things where it has continued to find ways to breathe life into itself and into the band and and um you know, ironic or not, I I think it's really cool that uh you know, the song has become a mainstay for us and in in a lot of ways like connected with so many people again and again and again. And uh mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thankful for that. So, and we close our show with it every time, no matter what. So that's always fun. Oh, that's cool. I love that. I love that it's just a song that it's got its own internal motivation of like, I will not be forgotten. I will find <laughs> yeah. a way. Yeah, to like exactly. Reach the the highlight and the spotlight every time. Every few years, I'm coming back. That's really mm -hmm. cool. 
All right, well, this this is such a good song. So everybody enjoy. This might be a throwback for some of you, and it might be like, I don't know, some of you might know it from its recent resurgence on TikTok. So, dear Marie, count me in. Dang, that's so fun. That song made me so happy to listen to it. <laughs> Just like, I love how music will take you right back to like an era of your life and a time and a vibe, and that one really does. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so I have a, a very serious question for you right now. You mentioned before that you like Marvel movies, and I'm curious, what is your favorite Marvel film? Oh, okay. Coming in with the hard hitting. I know, I know. We had to get here. You really had to do this to me. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. From a from a movie standpoint, I really, I probably have to give it to Winter Soldier. Really? Okay. I think so. Maybe Cap- Captain America Two. Um, yeah, that one, that one's good. It's, yeah, it's up there for me. Uh, but I don't know. I like it's so hard to answer at this point because there's like sixty movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love, I love the, I love the first Doctor coming. Strange movie. Sorry, what? What'd you say? I was, talking I was just to saying, you. and they keep coming. You just keep thinking that it's like dying down, and then like five more will come out, and you're like, oh. They're, they're going strong. But sorry, what what did you say? No, it's it's exactly. It's really hard to keep up with. And it's really hard to like pick one that's a favorite because I, I at this point, I'm like dividing them into like subcategories and then I'm picking my favorites from like those different little bunches and all that. Um, I mean, I love I love the first Doctor Strange just for the visuals mm. and the whole oh, yeah. vibe. Um, and I mean... Sheesh, what else? I think Spider-Man Homecoming is the most adorable Spider-Man story ever mm-hmm. told on film. That's a great one. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all, they're all, they all have a lot to them. Um, I also really liked uh, from the series, like, uh, why am I blanking on the name now? Um, the, uh, <laughs> I'm going to need a minute to think on this one. Um, the Egyptian gods and, and that whole thing. Help me out here. The Egyptian gods. Um, let's see if the chat knows. Someone they in might. Chat. I just, I'm literally drawing a blank on the name. Wait, it's like a new series you're saying. Um, yeah, it was one of the series. Um, Moon Knight. Moon Knight. There we go. Oh, okay. There it is. Yeah. I thought that was uh, some cool, interesting, compelling storytelling. I enjoyed that one. Yeah. Um, have you ever, um, I haven't watched Moon Knight, so maybe I'll have to give that one a try. But have you ever watched all the Marvel movies in chronological order it would be quite a task now but i did it several years ago and when there was i think 30 of them and it was Mm -hmm. so fun to watch them all like in the chronological order and you kind of see all these little easter eggs that are in them and anyways it was our one of my covid um things that i did (laughs) where i was like we need something to be excited about let's watch one marvel movie a night for a month um but anyways it was quite a fun I, i enjoyed it way more than i thought i would First of all, respect. And second of all, yes, I have. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not alone in that. I'm talking about it to an expert. Excuse me. I apologize <laughs> for thinking you hadn't done such a thing. It was the same time period, though. It was like it was like the second everything went into lockdown. It was like, all right, what do I do this week? And it was you right. know, that was the vibe. You know, the funny thing is, I remember, like, I was actually with my sister. I decided to stay with her once the lockdown happened, you know, and I thought for, like, what, you know, a few weeks. But I remember we were like, well, let's start immediately because we probably won't even be able to get through all of them. And then, you know, two months later, three months later, we're like, oh, well, I guess we had plenty of time. But (laughs) (laughs) yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. During the lockdown, like, did you guys kind of just take a break did you write a lot of music i feel like every artist dealt with it very differently yeah i mean it was a uh, it was a strange time for everyone obviously goes without saying um but we for all time low specifically it was it was a weird one because we had an album ready to go and it actually it came out um as lockdown went into like its fullest um Mm -hmm. and and it was sort of like i remember getting a phone call from the head of our label uh, about a week or two weeks prior. And he just said, Hey, what do you want to do? Um, how, like, how are you feeling? You, you know, it's not looking promising for, you know, shipping records and uh, you know, mm-hmm. everything, everything is shutting down. And yeah, 
I, I just sort of went like we we both had we both sort of landed on the same thing, and that for us was, um, you know, sales don't matter, numbers don't matter, shipping doesn't matter, none of this is important. Um, the only two things that we really considered was like, does it feel appropriate to put something out and push it mm. during this during this really heavy time? Right. And, and would it bring, does it bring more good than it brings distraction or does it bring, you know, does it, does it kind of conflate things? And, and we sort of, in that moment, it was a really difficult decision to make. And I'm not sure that there was a right answer, but we, for us decided um, that we were going to, we, we put the record out and obviously, uh, but we, we decided <laughs> to put the record out and um, we, we kind of said to ourselves, like, look, things feel really bleak right now. They don't, they're, you know, obviously things are, are very heavy and people are going through uh, so many different difficult moments in their lives. And if this so much as brings, you know, 40 minutes of levity to mm-hmm. the people that care about our little pocket of the world, um, then let's go for it. And yeah. that's what we decided to do. Mm-hmm. And, and we put the record out and basically just marketed a record from home like it was kind of not really about you know all of all of the typical things that you do during an album release cycle or anything like that you know we we kind of just dropped the music made some content from our homes you know we did our, it was a, it was that phase i think everybody was in the same phase if you were in the music business or the i guess any facet of the entertainment or content business as well call it these days um mm-hmm. was was kind of like you just you just found a way and you threw stuff at the wall and you and you figured out what stuck and um that was sort of the gear that we shifted into in that time period and we again it was just about like can we all give some people half hour an hour two hours of happiness in their day to day when we all know that we're all going through this shared experience of like what the heck is going on mm-hmm. um and that's kind of the approach we took, you know, it's, it's, it's weird looking back on it, but I, I don't regret it. You know, I, I, I'm really thankful that we had all that music ready to go in a body of work. And it was all music that was written in such a positive way for us as a band. Um, so it had this sort of energy to it that felt really authentic to what all time low was all about. And that has always, again, been about sort of just like uplifting, um, and yeah, we just we just decided to rock it, and uh, we figured the rest out as we went. We did some live stream performances. We did some, you know, mm-hmm. acoustic versions of songs from home, and um, it was and a bunch of live streams. And like we were doing, you know, sort of like the meet and greets that we would do at our shows. We were doing from, you know, over Zoom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like, right, yeah. Kind of stuff. And it was it was awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, a rough landing in the chat says wake up sunshine was a legit ray of sunshine top five album for me. So, you know, it, it, what a cool outlook to be like, Hey, if we can just bring people some joy and, you know, cause I mean, people needed that so much at that time, everybody needed to have something to feel like they could connect with. So what a cool thing. Did you ever get to tour that album? We did. Fortunately, um, you know, we, we kind of, we were able to coast on it. And, and one of the very unexpected uh, positives from that record f- for us as a band was that um, we, we sort of had our first like real uh, radio hit from that album. Um, it was the song Ooh. Monsters and uh, it, it kind of ended up doing really, really well at alternative radio. And that was something that we really had never broken into before. Um, mm. And it, you know, and this is not meant to sound like me flaunting because it's really not, but it just, it kind of blew all of our minds and it went on to sort of have this like wild legacy at alternative radio. It, it was number one for a really long time. And um, it kind of carried us through in the sense that we had this thing going, even while we couldn't be out on the road doing the thing that we, you know, hang our hats on, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, by the time things did start to open back up and, we were able to do some outdoor shows and, and start getting tours in the works again. Uh, we were still kind of riding the high of what that song was doing. Um, and yes, yeah, so we got to go out and, and play all those songs for, we did this, we did this tour called sad summer fest that we became involved with, with our good friends uh, in this band called the main. 
and a bunch of other amazing bands, Grayscale and Movements, mm -hmm. and, um, a bunch of great guys and, and gals out there. And um, we, that was sort of the first introduction to, to touring back after lockdown. And it was surreal. It was very surreal. Like the first sad summer show, I think was like 12 or 14,000 people in Anaheim. Wow. The most people we've headlined for in that area. And it was just this like, okay, okay, here we go. Wow. You know, it was, it was, it was on one hand, it was very like, I wanted to cry because of how many people came out and stuck around for us and wanted to see our band play. And on the other hand, I wanted to cry because we were all back out in the world with each other. And then I wanted to cry because it was so daunting just walking on stage again. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a pretty nutty experience. Absolutely. I, I do remember a lot of that same feeling like going on my first tour post COVID and it was like a lot of like conflicting emotions and it, you know, and um, it was a powerful experience, just full of like gratitude, but also like, oh my gosh, I got to get used to stage nerves all over again and learn how to deal with this. But like, um, it, was, it was a really powerful experience. And mm -hmm. also, I, and I agree with everybody in the chat who's saying, hey, your flaunting is well deserved. And, and I agree. <laughs> it's like, you know what? You have worked your tail off for, you know, two decades and you've ridden the highs and lows and like you you definitely deserve to say like, we had this huge success at radio. And I remember watching it happen from the sidelines and just being so excited for you guys. Cause um, you know, I, I feel like we both have taken less of a conventional route to being musicians sure. wins. They mean so freaking much. And it's, yep. it's so exciting. So like, yes, absolutely. You know, own those moments. Cause you've, you've earned them. And um, thank you. Thank you know, you, so you had so many of us were so excited for you. Oh, that's really mm -hmm. kind of you to say. I was actually, I was going to ask what, so, uh, what was your first experience back after lockdown? What, like, what was the first show, first tour? What did you end up doing that got you back on stage? Well, you know, when, um, COVID happened, we had a summer tour in the U S booked and what Live Nation decided to do was take all the tours that were booked for that year, 2020, and plop mm. them into the exact same date in 2021. And so we were like, cool, we, we agreed to do that. And as that tour was approaching, the world was still in lockdown, but we kept the dates and we didn't cancel them because we kept hoping. And it turned out that we were actually the first tour to go out. <laughs> because wow. Wow kept those dates and it was the weirdest experience because it was us and I think there was one country band I don't remember who it was but so like all the agents everybody was just kind of watching our tour to see if it worked and what yep. would happen and it, we just felt like this little experiment um but it was so exciting it was I believe the beginning of July in 2021 and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like I said, just stepping out, like we all just sobbed after that first show and the second show and the third, cause it was like, we couldn't believe we were getting to do what we loved. And you could feel from the audience that they were so excited to be at a show cause it was all of their first show since lockdown. So it was like a wildly special experience, um, that I'll like that tour will always be like a standout in my mind. That is so wild to hear, honestly, because I, I, I remember feeling that same feeling. You know, I think in that time period, July, uh, it, you know, we went and did, I think it was our pr pretty much our first time back on a stage. We went and did Lollapalooza. And that was, you know, obviously a lot of people in, in, a yeah. park in, in Chicago. And it was just the energy there was so unbelievably, uh, A, special and B, just unlike anything we'd ever experienced before and and yeah i you know good on you for getting out there and uh i guess you know carrying the torch and leading the way that's that's it it that's awesome and i'm glad it went well for you yeah we were we were glad it were carrying the torch for the music industry you know <laughs> but it just happened to be kind of how the you know it crumbled we're like oh this is this is interesting like not what we planned on not trying to lead the way it just happened of course um, but uh, yeah, I actually want to ask you before before we run out of time and lose you. So for those of you who may not know this, we actually have a song together. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Alex sings Time to Fall in Love on my Christmas album, my first Christmas album. And um, I remember, I feel like you were on tour when you recorded it. Like you were overseas, I believe in a hotel somewhere. Am I mistaken? I was, I was in Japan. 
No way. Yeah. So I, I remember like talking through it and you sent me the the song and um I was just obviously like way down to do it because I adore you and always wanted to work with you. And we had I like I think at, at the time we had been talking about various different ideas of how we could work with each other on something. And yeah. um and like yeah, you 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 had this thing going on and yeah, I just I remember you shoot me the song and you wrote it with a, a good friend of mine, Cameron, and um I uh, I was like I have to, we have to do this. We have to figure this out, and because um, so th- who you wrote the song with uh, with, with uh, Jordan and Cameron. Yeah, and and I so I wrote one of my favorite all time low songs um, with Cameron, and oh, uh, so like when I saw like you sent it, and then you were like I wrote it with with these folks, and I was like oh this just makes too much sense. Um, yeah, I was like, I'm going to sweeten the deal for you. Cause I remember <laughs> talking to them and we're, they're like, who do you see singing this? And I was like, well, actually like I wanted to work with Alex and they were like, no way we know Alex. So we're like, okay, we'll hit him from both sides. You can't say no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, there was no choice there at that point. There was no choice in my mind. Um, and yeah, it's, we were, we were in Japan. I think we, uh, there, there's a band called one. Okay. Rock and their, their singer's name is Taka. And, um, Taka had a studio available in Tokyo and um, like just by happenstance, the, the, they had availability in the studio and, um, and yeah, like after enough things lined up, uh, we, we went and cut the song in, uh, in Tokyo on a day off. And um, it was, it was such a wild experience. I was, I remember being like so jet lagged. And just oh. such a, I was like such a zombie as we went to the studio and I kind of felt like I did the whole thing in a daze and it all felt like this wild, uh, holiday dream. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, like, yeah. I'm singing a Christmas song in, in, you know, June and I'm in Tokyo, right. what's happening. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was just a really, I don't know. It was so much fun. And yeah, it's, it's, I'm just happy to be on something that we made together, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, it's one that I I can't do it live. Like that song I've thought about, like, how can I do this live in my show? And like, I can't do it without you singing it. So I've actually never performed it live, but it's such a fun song. And I, I love it because it's such a unique Christmas song. You know, it, it fully has all the feels of the holidays in it, but it's also just like really really unique in the holiday market. And so anyways, I will always love that song. And I, when I heard that you were in Japan and you've literally just gotten there and you're on tour, I just know how special those days off are. And so I was so grateful that you took the time to like get a studio, go in on your like precious, precious day off. So no, there was no question. I would have, I would have anytime, any place, feeling any kind of way I would have done that it was like it was a no-brainer oh well thank you so much and also the great thing about Christmas music is it's like I get to play it every year you know in some way shape or form so um and I've heard it as I've been walking around like shopping which is funny I'm like oh my gosh (laughs) there there it is um to, to me it was like how is this not in just every like modern Christmas movie ever that was always my thing it was like any like Hallmark, Netflix, like any any Christmas right? movie, is like this is the soundtrack. <laughs> it really sure. does feel like that montage scene, you know, yep. in a yeah, in a Hallmark yep. movie or in like that Netflix rom com. So I'm like, okay, but maybe in the best it's way, three pitches. Yeah, in the in the good way, not in the not in the bad way. No, there is no bad way for a, a rom com montage scene. I'm a big rom com fan. So, <laughs> by the way, also I'm looking at chat, and uh, there seems to be this like recurring theme of Lindsay made me do it. And, I've and noticed that, supporter. guys. I'm not that kind of a person. What what's going <laughs> on, everybody? <laughs> I have a feeling this one's gonna last too. I'm gonna see this for a minute, but mm-hmm. I bet anything that happens, Lindsay made me do it. I was in Japan. I had no choice. <laughs> yep, exactly. Run with it. <laughs> okay, so you also have a new song that came out recently called Sleepwalking, right? Yes. So Sleepwalking okay, is the f- first single. Yeah, Sleepwalking is the first single that we put out from uh, this new record. And we kind of just like dropped it out of the blue um, late last year and kind of without any indication that a record was coming or anything like that. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, it sort of felt like a spiritual successor to like Monsters and Once in a Lifetime. And it had this, excuse me, it had this sort of like through line 
um, that was that felt like creatively carried it into this new era that we're now getting into. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, we um, it, it is. I think it's like number three right now, or number two, or something oh! on radio. So it's it's having another little moment, which I'm very you know humbled and excited about. And um, yeah, just just really cool. And and uh, it's. Um, it's a fun one. It's, I think I'm like, it's one of the ones that I'm most excited to play live mm. uh, from this new batch of music. I think it, Why it, so? it, Why are you excited about this one specifically? You know, when you, you know, when you have a body of work and you kind of parse through it and you go, okay, this one's going to go off because it's fast. This one's going to go off because it has a great energy. This one's going to go off because it's sort of like it tugs at the heartstrings. And there's mm-hmm. just a thing with sleepwalking that has this, uh, it has a, it's somber, but it's also kind of driving and powerful. And I, I feel like our set doesn't have that yet. Mm. So it's, it's one of those songs that in all the, in all the time that we've been writing music and putting sets together and playing shows, it just checks a box that I feel like we hadn't really uh, checked yet. So I'm. Oh, I'm, I love that. That's gotta be super exciting. Cause you're like, you've obviously never written something quite with this feel to it. And it's like, Oh, a new side of myself has just emerged. <laughs> yeah. It's always about how it translates to the live show and what it's going to do and how it serves the live show. And this one is, mm-hmm. yeah, this one is that. Awesome. Well, before we play it, you mentioned something, you said it kind of leans into this new era that you're going into. And so I'm actually just starting to write a new album now. And you know, you've written so many albums. How do you find that balance between like staying true to your voice and like, you know, we're always going to sound like ourselves, but then also how do you keep finding new ways to sound like yourself? Uh, Lindsay, that is, <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, at the end of the day, like what's tricky is we, and this isn't meant to sound reductive at all, but for me, like we make, what a lot of people label as pop punk music. And that is a really specific and niche genre. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, obviously that's how we came up and that's what we, that kind of the sound that developed for us early on. And then we sort of, it became this malleable thing that we tried to like move around in a lot. And, and I think we've done all these different versions of, what that genre could potentially be. But I I mean, I, and I'm sure you feel the same way, like as the artist making the music, you kind of don't box yourself in that much. You don't really look at it that way. You don't go like, how do I make, how do I reinvent pop punk again (laughs) or whatever it may be? Um, So I think it's this thing of it. At the end of the day, there's this, what I've landed on is there's this core idea of what all time low is. And it's like, a lyrical and melodic sensibility that I believe and have have found that I bring to the table uniquely. And I think, you know, you do the same in your music, the way you write and craft your melody lines um, that is so signature. And that just becomes a part of who you are. It's like your little, I guess it's like how you would say it's like someone's handwriting. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then if you look at like the song as sort of a piece of paper, and so you're sort of scribbling your handwriting over this piece of paper and you make that piece of paper your own as well. Um, and I sort of exist within that world. I, I kind of go like, look, I, I we're not going to come out, I don't think, who knows, we could be together for another 10 years and go, you know, way off the deep end here. But like, we're not going to come out and make a country album, you know? So like, <laughs> I know I don't operate in that corner of music. And so I have these these sets of of sounds and sonic palettes and things that I really like to play around in when we make music for all time low. And after that, it's really more about the, the, the essence of the idea I'm trying to get across and the, the handwriting that we put down on it. And I think more often than not now, it's about just knowing when to identify like, yeah, that feels like a really signature all time low song for this era. And that's Mm -hmm. usually how it, it defines itself. Well, I'm super excited to listen to Sleepwalking and hear like what this new sound is. And I'm going to try to think of it in like a live show setting. So anyways, I'm super excited to hear it. This is Sleepwalking. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. That's a Thank really you. fun song. And I, I agree with the chat that I was like, oh my gosh, I could just dance to this. Like this is the kind of song that makes you want to like throw your hands up in the air and kind of like throw your head from side to side. Like it's just Let's got go. that, that free spirit about it. Um, and I saw also a lot of comments saying that 
you know, you could totally countryify this if you wanted to. <laughs> a, a comment. Um, and then also, funny story, I have a song called Sleepwalking as well. Very, very different, but still. Um, oh, that's rad. We need to do a mashup. Oh my gosh. It's a, yeah, very, very different. It would be really interesting to see. And mine only has one word, just sleepwalking. So I'm sure we could figure out something. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. That sounds like a drop, like meant, meant to happen. How do we figure right? this out? The, the collab that nobody knew they were looking for. The mashup. Send the stems, and Send the stems immediately. Absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll text you. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious. I, I always love to like tiptoe around this question, but just how do you support your mental health in an industry that has so many ups and downs? We've talked a little bit about it, but like, do you have any go-to practices or things that you do to help like maintain like that mental clarity? Wow. Um, an amazing question. And, and one that is so important. Uh, and to be honest, like in the business and in life, you know, I think the older, the older I've gotten, the more I've realized uh, how much I missed out on, actively seeking guidance and counsel um, and, and just a little more presence in my own um, process, I guess, uh, throughout my twenties. Um, and, you know, I, I've, uh, one of the things I, I would suggest is, is therapy. You know, if, if you have mm -hmm. the ability to, uh, to, to do it, you know, I know that obviously it comes with a financial burden and, and all of that. But if, if you're able to, um, you know, uh, therapy is, is super helpful. And, and I think, uh, if you're able to dive into it, um, it, it, it can work wonders. Um, mm -hmm. I, admittedly, like I'm, I'm one of those people that has a, I'm in and then I'm out and then I'm back in and then I'm back out. And I have stints of time where I feel as though it's not helping me. And I have times where I feel like as though it is. And that's, that's sort of like, my journey with it. Um, and yeah. it, I think it's different for everyone and, you know, but it's definitely been a, uh, a huge help for me, um, when it's helped, you know, and I think a big part is just establishing almost like a base level, um, and, and setting some ground rules for yourself and becoming a little bit more self-aware of your tendencies is, is such a huge, mm. huge part of, of beginning to heal the uh, maybe heals the wrong word, but identify the pieces of yourself that, that maybe don't um, serve you as well. And, That's so uh, well said. Yeah. I always, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a, per, it's such a personal thing um, that I try not to project it too, too much for fear of sort of stepping on someone else's process. But like, mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think being attentive is, is one of the biggest things. And then, and then not being afraid to, um, take time for yourself. I, I think pers again, personally speaking, like I was always, and I and am always someone who thrives on putting myself out there and, and, um, kind of getting the feedback and, and feeling validated by that feedback in some way. And, and really, uh, you know, realizing that and I think a lot of that has to do with being on stage and getting the feedback in a live environment and a show environment you know and it, it sort of bleeds into your character and into who you are as a human being um, and then sort of realizing that every now and then you need to take a step back uh, or at least I needed to take a step back um, time to time and, and just say like who am I what am I doing separate of all of this um, that, that's been a huge thing for me to just kind of tune out back to uh, you know the thing that you opened your show with that I, that I happened to like tune in halfway through, but um, how you were saying like social media breaks um, kind of, because I think it removes this, this illusion that uh, other people's input voices, um, <clears throat> you know, have this heavy effect on us and everything that we see constantly has a really mm -hmm. heavy effect on us. And um, taking a little bit of a step back from that can be huge as well. Yeah, no, checking I love in with yourself. Yes, checking in with yourself. I just love the way you said, um, you know, that it's all about, I think you said awareness and identifying the different pieces of yourself. Um, I, I just thought that was really well said because we're all so complex and 
it really is just learning. And sometimes it's not even about healing right away, those pieces. You rephrase that and you say, wait, no, identifying the different pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember when I found out that I was like years ago when I was struggling with anorexia and when I first found out that like, oh my gosh, this is happening inside of me. And I I finally admitted that I had this issue. My first therapist said something that really impacted me. And she was like, you're not going to heal this you're going to learn to manage it. And, you know, and like you said, it's just all about realizing this is what I have inside of me right now. And these are the different pieces. And by being able to like step up back and see all those different pieces, it allows you to know, all right, how are we going to, how are we going to work with this? Um, So anyways, thank you for sharing that. um, Cause I, thank you for sharing. I mean, it's, it's exactly that point. It's like, how do I, how do I deal with, with myself today? I think mm -hmm. to your point is really great. It's a really great takeaway. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, I love that. How do I deal with myself today? Because every day is going to be different and you're going to be stronger on some days and some things are going to be harder on other days. And so, yeah, just like, how am I today? And what are we going to do with today? You know, what are we going to do with what we have in our toolbox today? Yep. <clears throat> Very well no. said. That's beautiful. Um, Okay, my last question for you before I let you go in your merry way is, um, okay, this this is going to come across so cheesy, but I used to ask like the youth group I taught years ago, I would ask them, what is your peach and your pit in life right now? Like, what is something that you are loving in your life, your peach? And then maybe what's one thing in your life that's a little bit harder? Ooh, that is so good. Peach and pit is so good. <laughs> what's um, your peach and pit? <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay. Let me think. My peach right now in life is my uh, my surroundings, my home, my family, my yeah. animals, my the things that bring me joy on a daily basis. When um, when the pit gets rough, you know, right? uh-huh. to be honest, it's it's sort of it's that I'm looking at it from that from the inside out right now. It's kind of like when things stack up and when things become a little bit overwhelming or daunting or or not so pleasant. It's like I I step outside and I look at all the things that I'm really grateful for. And I, it kind of grounds me. And I re- mm. remember, you know, that that's what's important. Um, so that would be the peach. And I think the pit, uh, truthfully right now is um, probably, it's a bit of one, it's like one of those, like a new year's resolution um, hangover almost like where it's like, mm-hmm. I, I, I told myself I was going to do this. And I haven't got any better at it. Um, and it's, it's just being in touch with my, my, uh, the friends who aren't within my, like within arm's reach. So the friends who are a little bit more spread out, not being, uh, as connected to them and as, as outreaching to them as I would like to be. But, um, you know, that's one of those things that you, like we just said, it's like you, you tackle it every day and, uh, you do, you know, you, sometimes you do a little better and sometimes you slip and that's okay. And, um, yeah, but my, my pit is just, uh, you know, the, the wanting to connect a little more with, with the homies. <laughs> yeah. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do yeah, as people sure. spread out and life gets busy and, you know, so that's a, also, that's a great New Year's goal. I love it. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. This was so fun. And, you know, next time you're back in LA, let me know. Um, it would be great to see you. But again, just thank you for being here and for sharing so much with all the listeners and all the listeners. Also, thanks for joining us today. Lindsay, thank you so much for having me on. Honestly, when you hit me up about this last week, it was such a pleasant surprise and so out of the blue. And uh, yeah, it, it meant so much that you thought of me and I, this has been such a like nice, insightful and just cool conversation. So thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, uh, best of luck with wherever you're headed next. And what, you know, and I'm so excited for you guys to just keep making awesome stuff. You guys never cease to put out great things into the world. So yes, Same thank you. you. For that. All right. Well, take care and I'll, we'll, we'll catch up soon. I'm, I'm sure another like three years or something, right? For sure. We got to do the sleepwalking collab. Let's go. <laughs> okay. I'll send the stems. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Thanks, Lindsay. Bye. Bye. And thanks for everyone in the chat and listening and everything. Love you guys. Bye.